Isn't it great to be a part of God's church? I am thankful every day, talking about giving thanks, I'm thankful every day, Ken, that God called me in the ministry. <laughs> you maybe know that my grandfather is a pastor. Did any of you all know that? My grandfather is a pastor. My great-grandfather was a singing evangelist, and he went from church to church. And uh, then, of course, my dad has served as a pastor. My great uncles, two of them served as a pastor. Uh, and I have an uncle who's a pastor. And I did not want to be a pastor. I, I did not, I didn't, that's not a career choice that I made, honestly. I was going to be a trumpet player, a musician. And by the way, I'm thankful that God called me away from that. <laughs> Uh, but nonetheless, that was my plan. And actually, I was headed to Disney World. I was going to go down there. I was going to stay, and I was just going to make a career being at Disney World playing my trumpet. And the Lord literally called me, literally called me. Would you be willing to come and help us and serve? And so I left Disney World, where I never did go. I had an offer to go. I told him I'm not coming, and I, I went to Glasgow, Kentucky, and began the full-time ministry. Boy, that was a long time ago. That was 1991. Isn't that a long time ago? And so I went, and I've never had a regret. Well, maybe every once in a while, but not, not much. And I love the church. How many of you know God loves the church? God loves his church. Yes, give thanks and praise for that. He loves his church. He, we often think about God's relationship with us as individuals, and that is very much true. God loves each one of us. God has a plan for each one of us. But God's sending Jesus back, not for a bunch of glorified individuals, but he's sending him back for his, say it with me, his church. He's coming back for his church. And so when the trumpet does sound, not the ice cream truck, but the trumpet, those who are in Christ will rise, and that'll be his church. And we're referred to as his bride. And every time there's a wedding and, and what happens at the wedding, the, the organ, the piano, or something sounds, and, and everybody stands, and the groom steps out to receive his bride, and the bride comes, and it's a beautiful picture of Christ who will receive his church. Won't that be a glorious day? And we'll be with him forever. And so I want to talk to you today about the church, and I want to talk to you today about baptism, because these two subjects are oftentimes misunderstood, and there's a tremendous amount of confusion. First, let me just take you back to the Old Testament. Are you ready? Now, I'm not going to ask you to turn there, but in the Old Testament, how many of you ever heard a study or did a Sunday school or read a lesson about the temple of God? Anybody? Raise your hand. Interactive. You, you've heard about the temple, right? That uh, it was David's idea, but Solomon built it. And so we have this beautiful temple, and then it was torn down, and it was rebuilt again. And then we have a temple in Ezekiel that was never built, but it's a picture of the heavenly temple. And we find out that the earthly temple was a reflection of a heavenly reality that we can't see. And so everything in the temple was there for a reason, to teach us. And so we have parts of the temple that, that are required for cleansing. We have parts of the temple where you go in and you're, you're with God. You have parts of the temple where the sacrifice is being offered up or where the aroma is being offered up representative of the prayers of God's people. And so the earthly temple was a representation of a heavenly reality. Are you with me so far? And as an earthly temple, it was run by fallen and failed people because the Bible tells us that there is no one righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We understand that as the doctrine of depravity. Look to the person to your right or left and say, you're depraved. Depravity means in our fallen and sinful state, there's nothing good in us. And so in our fallen and sinful state, none of us would even follow God. He has to do something, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. So in the Old Testament, the earthly reality of the, uh, the earthly representation of the heavenly reality was operated by sinful priests who, who constantly had to ask God for forgiveness and be cleansed. And, and it was filled with, and people would come into the courts of that by, by fallen and failed people. And interestingly, if you were a man and you were to come into the temple, you had to be circumcised, which was a symbol of God's covenant, that you were a covenant person, and that was important for you 
to be able to go in the temple. We see in the New Testament there's some real serious argument when Paul wants to bring somebody in there that's not been circumcised. And so in this fallen earthly temple, there are pictures of the heavenly reality, but it's still, it's still kind of messed up. And in that, we have a beautiful lesson of the reality of God's church. And so the earthly temple is now not reflected in a building. It's not reflected in something up on a mountain in Jerusalem. It's reflected in you and me. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. You might just want to write this one down. This one's not going to be on your screen. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought for a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. Our bodies, now we are representations of the heavenly reality. Isn't that awesome? And though we are fallen and failed, we are still representations. And so today, I want to talk to you about four different things. I want to talk to you about two different baptisms, and I want to talk to you about two different churches. Are you ready? Let's start first with the two baptisms. I want to talk to you today about the Holy Spirit baptism. The Holy Spirit baptism. The Bible talks about this Holy Spirit baptism in Acts chapter 2. They were all in one place. They were all in unison. And the Holy Spirit fell upon them and came upon them like flaming tongues of fire. This was promised by Jesus. He says, I'll send you a comforter. I'll send you one who will lead you in understanding the scriptures. I'll send you somebody who will give you strength and power to be able to live the life that I'm calling you to live. And sure enough, at that day, the church was born. God sends his Holy Spirit. Everyone in that room was filled with his Holy Spirit. And subsequently, those who come to faith in Christ are filled with God's Holy Spirit as well. We call this the doctrine of regeneration. Will you say that with me? The doctrine of regeneration. It's an important doctrine. Doctrine simply means teaching. It's a teaching of the church. And Reformed churches, of which we are a part, understand the necessity of the Holy Spirit coming into our lives to give us what we call the new birth. How many of you were alive when Jimmy Carter was president? He, he, he coined a phrase that, that became well used or overused in the church. He was not just an ordinary Christian. He was a what? Born again Christian. Which kind of distinguished this evangelical movement from maybe just... Uh, the traditional churches. In other words, he believed that God had come into his life and gave him new life, that he had been born again. Earlier, Joni read us the scripture out of John about Nicodemus, and Jesus says to Nicodemus, have you been born again? And Nicodemus says, how can I enter back into my mother's womb? Don't, don't you know that a lot of times people looked at Jesus the way my chihuahua looks at me? How can I enter in again to my mother's womb? That's just gross and weird. Jesus said, you're a man of the scriptures, don't you know? Basically, what Jesus is referring to here is regeneration. That is, the Holy Spirit coming into our lives and giving our spiritual lives new birth. And so the entrance into the invisible church is the baptism of God's Holy Spirit. Regeneration. You can't be a part of God's church without being born again, without receiving the Holy Spirit. You see, remember when Adam was born? You remember what God did? He forms him out of the clay, out of the dirt, and you remember what he did to bring him to life. He breathed his spirit, pneuma, wind, into Adam, and Adam came alive. But you remember what God said to Adam and Eve, that if they sinned, what would happen to them? On the day of you eat of that fruit, you shall what? Surely die. Now, did Adam and Eve die on that day? And so is God a liar? Because they died spiritually, and their spiritual death ultimately led to their physical death. And so God's Holy Spirit was no longer living in them. But in Christ, get this. He comes and breathes life into us again. Hallelujah. Isn't that the best thing you ever heard? We who are dead in sin have been now made alive in God. How? Through the reception and baptism of God's Holy Spirit. Praise God. He has, well, let me just tell you what he's done. The Old Testament refers to 
refers to this softening of the heart. It's actually called in the Old Testament a circumcision of the heart. The outward sign of circumcision, that, that act, was to be a representation of what was happening on the inside of the people of Israel. And so we see in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26 and 27, one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit. Everybody say new spirit. A new spirit in you. I will remove from your heart of stone, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. How awesome is that? The book of Joel says, in the last days I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. That means men and women from all backgrounds, Jewish, Greek, you and me, hallelujah. And how many of you today have received the wonderful gift of the baptism of God's Holy Spirit? As he's come into your life and allowed you to be born again, you have received that new spirit and he's taken out your old stony heart that would never want to follow God and given you a heart of flesh and you have the desire to follow his decrees and his teaching. Praise God. That is available. And so here is the thing, though. Only God knows who has truly been baptized in his Holy Spirit. You and I just can't really get this down. How many of you know that Jesus said, in the last days, many will come to me and say what? Lord, Lord. And they'll talk about all the good things that they did. And he will say to them what? Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. You know what he's saying there? He's saying there are many people who are in church today who are not part of the true church. In other words, they can go through the motions. They can fake it. They can blend in and they can fit in. But they're not saved. They've never been born again. They've never had this infilling of God's Holy Spirit. Their hearts have never been changed. They go through the motions, but it's very outward and not inward. This is scary to me. As a pastor, it is hard for me to think there will be people who sat under my preaching, who were in Sunday school classes with me, even, even people who were serving on elder boards. It's hard for me to imagine that some of them will hear those words, depart from me. You worker of iniquity. But the Bible spells this out. It talks about a time when the sheep will be separated from the goats, when the wheat will be separated from the tares. And that is not my job. Only God knows. But listen, you can know too. You can know. We can know whether or not we have been baptized with his Holy Spirit. Well, let's talk about how we can know. Look at Titus chapter 3, verse 5. It says, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness. And so today, if you think, if you think that you're saved because you were baptized in water, that won't do it. If you think today that you're saved because you made a formal move to be a church member, guess what? That won't do it. I remember what the old singer Keith Green said Going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. If you think that because you were involved and sang in the choir, or because you served in some form or fashion at church, or because you were a good person, and you think those things are what saved you, guess what? That is not what does it. Nothing that we do in the flesh can give us a new birth of the Spirit. And so today, if you think that the things that you've done are what makes you worthy to be saved, you're wrong. He saved us, Titus 3, 5 says, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration, there's that word, and renewal of the Holy Spirit. This is what he's done. Those of us who are saved have received his Holy Spirit. We've been cleansed by his blood. We've been filled with him. He's taken out the heart of stone that says, I can do it on my own. I don't need you. And he's made us totally dependent upon him for life. Modern translations use the word such as rebirth rather than renewal. It's the same idea. And so this concept of being reborn is of great importance in the Bible. Again, Joni read for us earlier, John 3 a Jewish religious teacher named Nicodemus getting this idea for himself. 
And again, Jesus says to him in verse 3, Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless you're born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Again, Nicodemus questioned, and Jesus said again to him, I tell you again, truly, truly, unless one is born of water, that is human birth, and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. To be born again or regenerated is to start a new spiritual life, one that is from God rather than one from a human parent. Other passages affirm this teaching, this idea that we've got to be born again of God's Holy Spirit, that He's got to come and fill us. He's got to come and give us spiritual life. He's got to come and change our heart. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 and 2 notes that we used to be dead in our trespasses and sin. But going on in verse 5 and 6, it tells us that we have been born again, and it brings a radical change in our lives. Listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is a new Christ, he is what? A, say it with me, a new creation. The old has passed away. All has become new. And so when this thing happens, this is an internal and an invisible work. Some churches over the years have brought in what they call mourner's benches. And they say this is a sign that we can see when the Holy Spirit comes upon somebody. That is not in the Bible. That is a work. This is a work that happens of God inside our lives, and you may not see it happen in somebody else. When I became saved, I was in a meeting. It was at summer camp, and I was convicted of my sin. Boy, I was convicted of my sin. And when we went forward to receive communion at that camp, it was there, and nobody else knew what was happening to me, but I'll tell you this. I knew, and God's Holy Spirit knew. Amen? Some of you have been saved in the quietness of your own home, Some of you were saved in the glorious revival meeting at a church. Nonetheless, the work that's happened inside your life is an invisible work that God's doing and you are enjoying. It's an invisible work that leads to eternal and external visible changes. I want to say this again. This is important. When you are born again, when God fills you with His Holy Spirit, when you're baptized with His Holy Spirit, it is an invisible work, but listen, that leads to visible change. Do you understand that? Nobody can say he's born again and continue to live willingly and willfully in sin. You can't say, I've been born again, God's given me new life, all the old things have passed away, and continue to have a heart that's hardened against the things of God. And so there's another way for you to know today. Do you have a heart that wants to serve the Lord? Now, how many of you have a heart that wants to serve the Lord, but a brain that just, and a body that constantly gets in the way? Paul says, oh, wretched man that I am. I want to do the things that are right, but I keep messing up. You see, the key here is the desire to serve the Lord. I, uh, I've been a youth pastor, was a youth pastor for years, and you know what the number one question is? that I get from kids was, that I always got from kids? You want to guess? How far is too far? And you know what? That is not just true of kids. It's true of adults too. How much sin can I do (laughs) and still get by with it? If you're asking that question, you're in trouble. Because the question ought to be, how can I live in a way that's pleasing to God? Because that's what my heart wants to do, because I've been born again. I have a heart of flesh, not a heart of stone. And so, if you have that desire to serve the Lord, hallelujah, praise the Lord, you can know that you have been born again. Also, listen to me. Paul tells us in the book of Romans, in chapter 8, verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Man, I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for that today. Aren't you? The Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that what we are children of God. It's not in the works that you do. It's not in a, it's not in a baptismal certificate. It's not in a church role. It is His Spirit bearing witness with our spirit. And so if you have a heart that desires to serve God, if you're not relying on your works, but you're relying on His grace, and if His Spirit is bearing witness with your spirit, the whole world may not know this, but you can know it, and Jesus knows it. Hallelujah. And we don't have to live life wondering if we're going to heaven or not. 
we can live with blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. And so we see it's an internal work, and it is a one-time work. How can I enter again into your mother's womb? You can't, Nicodemus. Neither can we, neither do we have a second baptism of God's Holy Spirit. And so it's impossible to be saved without the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but we're not born again again. Now, there are subsequent works of the Holy Spirit in our lives. How many of you have experienced that? Where, where you experience the richness and the fullness of God or you surrender more and more of your life and, and you find yourself filled with Him, but it's not a subsequent baptism. You see, the new birth softens a believer's heart to do the will of God. And the more we do the will of God, the more God moves in our lives and the more of his presence we can discover. And so the baptism of God's Holy Spirit is God's work in us today. Let me ask you a question. Have you been born again? Have you received the true baptism, the baptism of God's Holy Spirit? It's an important question. Because I'll say it again, many, many, many church members will say, but Lord, did I not? And he'll say, depart from me. Today, you may have been in church. You may be even a leader in church. I'm going to tell you, I believe there are several pastors who lead churches who have never received the baptism of God's Holy Spirit and the regeneration and the new birth. Today, have you trusted in him through faith? Has he changed your heart? And do you have that wonderful witness of God's Holy Spirit in your life that says, you belong to me? I told you I want to talk to you about two baptisms. Let's talk about a second baptism. Are you ready? It's the baptism you and I mostly think about. If I say baptism, you're going to, you're going to think what? Water. Where's the water? And this is a baptism that is an earthly picture of the heavenly reality. It is the visible outworking of the invisible inworking work of God. And it is the one that God has given us, just like he gave us an earthly temple to represent everything that was going on in the heavenly temple. He's given us an earthly baptism to recognize the heavenly baptism. And isn't that awesome? And it's very much a picture. Today, we have the candles up here. You know why we have the candles up here? In case the power goes out, I can still grab one and be able to preach from my notes. That's not why we have the candles up here. Why do we have the candles up here? These are pictures of the presence of God's Holy Spirit in this room. And so we look at them and say, boy, those are pretty. But we're reminded that God's Spirit is here. We're reminded when we have this ring on our finger. This ring is not what makes us married. It really has nothing to do with marriage other than reminding me that I'm married, reminding everybody else that I'm married. Earthly baptism is water baptism, and there's a reason. Water has always been used throughout the Old Testament and again in the New Testament as a picture of cleansing. How many of you wash with water? Please raise your hand. <laughs> we use water because water cleanses. Water has always been used. And in the Old Testament, it was ceremonial ceremonially used to represent entire cleansing. If you washed your hands, it was a picture of you being entirely cleansed. And so no wonder it's used again here in the New Testament to talk about the cleansing. You know when the Holy Spirit comes into our life, what does he do? He cleans house. How many of you remember that day when the house was cleaned by God's Holy Spirit? There is a cleansing, and it's a picture of rebirth. When you were born, you passed through the waters. And when you're reborn, you pass through the waters. It's a picture of what happened there at Pentecost when God's Holy Spirit came down and landed on each purpose. It's a picture of that. It is a picture of so many things, but ultimately it's an outward demonstration of an inward reality. And so we see in Scripture they baptized in or with water. The word's used both ways. We're coming from Presbyterians. We believe baptism is absolutely important and essential. But we're not going to determine for you the mode the historic mode that we use is the pouring out. That is a beautiful picture. But we don't believe the effectiveness of the baptism is, is determined by the mode. Amen? And so we leave that up to your conscience. And I'll be able to sit down and talk to you about, about those methods and what they represent. But more than anything, it's that identification with Christ. 
It's that picture that says, I want everybody to know on the outside what's happened on the inside. It's very similar to a wedding ceremony where God has taken two hearts and united them together, and they want the world to know and to see. And so there's always an earthly reminder of a heavenly reality. And so in the Old Testament, we had the doctrine of circumcision. It was a sign and reminder of God's covenant. Ladies were not circumcised, but they came under the headship of their father or their husband as one together in him. And so Matthew 28, 19 says this, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so this is something that we do to others who are believers. When they become disciples, when God has moved in their lives and baptized them with His Holy Spirit, it's up to us then to baptize them in water. And so we know that the baptism of God's Holy Spirit is not something that we can do. And so here we're, we're talking about, in this Great Commission... The baptism with water. And so we see here that new believers were to be baptized with water. It was a requirement for entrance into the church, the visible church. It was after spiritual baptism. But listen to me, it does not lead to spiritual baptism. Just because you took a shower this morning doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit comes in after that. And just because somebody's baptized, it doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit comes in after that. And so earthly baptism does not lead to spiritual baptism. It follows spiritual baptism. Everybody understand that? Or look at me like this if you don't. I'll say it again. Spiritual baptism leads to earthly baptism. Amen? It's not the other way around. And so Ephesians, again, 2, 8, 9 says, We are saved by grace through faith. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so we see here that the earthly work does not lead to the heavenly reality. The heavenly reality leads to the earthly. And by the way, this is important to know. God is the one who in- initiates your, your spiritual baptism. You and I didn't play a part in our, in our physical birth, did we? You didn't determine, I'm going to be. And we all know this, and almost every denomination will believe the same thing, that God has to work in our lives before we will ever come to faith in Him. Some will argue whether or not when He moves in our hearts that we have a choice, but we all agree that He has to move in our hearts first. And so God moves in our hearts, we are saved This is a spiritual reality, and then in obedience, we are baptized with or in water as a physical representation of what God has done. Again, it's a requirement for entrance into the church, the visible church. It comes after spiritual baptism. It's an outward expression of an inward reality, a visible act reflecting an invisible reality. And listen, it can be faked. I sit down, I try to talk to people. I try to make sure that they're ready for baptism, but they can give me all the answers. They can give the elders all the answers and not have a change of heart. And so we can do the best we can to make sure that the people who are being baptized are truly saved. But again, we can't really know. But we do know this. Earthly water baptism should be accompanied by a testimony. Hey, uh... Savannah, honey, do you still have the Apostles' Creed up there for us? Can you pull that up for us? I I messed her up. I got it out of order. But are you all with me? Let's look at the Apostles' Creed. All right, let's look at this together. Let's say that first line. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Let's go on. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, He suffered under Pontius Pilate. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church. That's good enough. (laughs) This is called the Apostles' Creed for a reason. It really initiated and was evident in the early church. You see, whenever you came to faith in Christ, before the church would receive you, they would baptize you. And when they would baptize you, they would ask you what you believe. And so a lot of people would remember, 
memorize this, and they would recite this to say, this is what I believe. So you see that earthly baptism was accompanied with the testimony of our faith. I've come to faith in Christ. Maybe a talk about how he's done that. And then also an affirmation of our beliefs. Everybody with me? And so today, all who can affirm those beliefs, whether they're a believing Catholic or a Pentecostal, whether they're in China or whether they're in Mexico or whether they're in, in Nashville, Tennessee, everybody who has been born again and can, and can agree to those principles are part of God's church. Pretty awesome, huh? And so they would, they would testify to what they believe, but they would, also, they would also submit to the leadership of the church. And this was extremely important. And so it was accompanied by a testimony of the Apostles' Creed. It was given by the candidates for baptism. They would recite what they would, they would believe. They would maybe talk about what they came to understand and how God had worked in their lives. And it was also, listen, this is important, administered by a person who has say over the church. And so because there are those who are assigned to oversee the church, it's administered by one of the ones who are assigned to do that. Because it's under the care of the church. And so people were baptized. Now this baptism, friends, we know it's not what saves us, but it's extremely important. We never see an example, except for the thief on the cross, of someone who was saved and not baptized. And again, we know that the Holy Spirit baptism comes first, but it's always followed by an act of obedience to God and identifying with God. It was so important that in the early church, you could say, I'm saved. You could call yourself a Christian. But it wasn't until you were baptized when the Romans would persecute you. They would leave you alone, but the moment you identified with Christ and his church through baptism, you were in trouble with them. And yet people did it, knowing what it would lead to because it was so important to identify with Christ to identify with his church, and to let the world know on the outside what God had done on the inside. Have you been baptized? Not just with God's Holy Spirit, but have you given evidence to the world of what he's done in your life? Baptism is extremely important. The pouring out of the water is symbolic of the new birth, the filling of the Holy Spirit, the cleansing. For some, the going down and the old man buried and a new man coming to life, both are appropriate. But have you been baptized? Have you identified with Christ? Have you followed this first act of obedience in letting the world know that you are his? Today, if you want to be baptized today, we'll do it right here. We'll do it here in just a moment. And if you want to be baptized at the lake next week, hallelujah, we'll hold you under there and get you soaked. One way or the other, you're never obedient to God unless you've been baptized with water after you've come to be saved. I told you I wanted to talk about two churches. Let me talk about these quickly today. Number one, the invisible church. Everybody look around. Did you ever have an invisible friend when you were little? Some of you still have invisible friends, and they're sitting right beside you right now, kind of creeping me out. There is an invisible church. This may be new to some of you, but it is very much a reality. It is, it is represented by the invisible temple up in heaven in the Old Testament. It is not only invisible, but it's universal. As a matter of fact, let me just give you the definition. It is all the saved of all the ages. That in the past and that to come. It includes your Baptist friends and your Pentecostal friends and your Methodist friends and your Presbyterian friends and your Cumberland Presbyterian friends. It includes people that you've never met who are in Africa. People that you've never met. If there's a saved Eskimo, they're in the invisible church. Isn't that cool? Let that sink in. Saved Eskimo. Cool. All right. Never mind. I'll be here all week. And I'll remind you again that God loves his church. That is his universal church. And in this universal church, again, it's all the saved of all the ages, including those who haven't been born yet. Isn't that, just let that blow your mind for a while. 
And we are part of this great cloud. And we, we will be united with people that we've never even known before. And we are one. We are one with the persecuted Christian in the Middle East. We are one with the Christian in China. We are one with the Christians that are down here at the Baptist Church or up here at the Methodist Church. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad about that today? We are one. And so, therefore, we can have fellowship. And we do. Your pastor is now the president of the Ministerial Association here in Goodlettsville. And so I am blessed to be a part of a group of pastors who get together and celebrate not our differences, but hallelujah, our unity, and that we are born-again believers of Jesus Christ. I'm, I am fortified by that. I'm built up by that. And so all the saved of all the ages, and God is the one who oversees entrance to this church, and only God knows who the members are. As a matter of fact, we see pictures of this in the scriptures. When we get to heaven, there's a church membership book there. And unless your name's written in that book of life, you're not a member. So the visible church is perfect. I mean, the invisible church is perfect. God knows who is there. And so we can have Christian assurance ourselves, but we don't always know who, is the, who, who else is in this particular group. But let me give you a few points about the invisible church. Number one, spiritual baptism is required for entrance into this church. The resulting faith is our seal. We have spiritual fellowship with those who have gone on before and with those who will come after. We are united with those who are in other parts of the world. We are united with all who are truly saved. And even though we may have some theological differences, as long as we can affirm those foundational orthodox believing, we are one with other Christians in other churches. And we are of one baptism. The Bible tells us there's one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. When it says one baptism, that's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's not the water baptism. Today, I'm glad to be a part of this invisible church. And there'll be a time when the trumpet sounds and the dead in Christ will rise. And that church will be called to be with her Lord forever in the air. Won't that be a great day? Let me ask you today. Are you a member of the invisible church? Are you, are, are you confident that your name is written on that roll. Again, the only entrance into that invisible church is through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, salvation. Finally, the second church is the visible church. It's the one you're sitting in right now. You can feel it. You can touch it. You can see it. You can talk to it. You can sing along with it. And so the local church is the visible temple. It is it is represented by sheep and goats. Today, there are some sheep here, and there are some goats. There are wheat, and there are tares. It is imperfect, and yet it is vitally important. It is ordained and commanded by God. Again, God loves his invisible church, but he also loves this earthly outgrowth of it. And we never, listen to me, friends, we never, ever, 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 see somebody who's floating around in the invisible church above and beyond the visible church. We are always, as an outgrowth of our participation in the invisible church, to be engaged and involved in the visible church. That means that every Christian should be engaged and involved in a local body of believers. And so immediately upon salvation, they were baptized and they became part of the church. And it was the church at Rome, or the church at Corinth, or the church at Thessalonica, or in your case, the Goodisville Church. And the way that worked was beautiful. They ate together. They shared things together. They encouraged one another. They loved one another. They prayed for one another. They strengthened one another. And so let me just give you a few beautiful things about this visible church. Again, it's the local church, the one that you and I experience. The universal church is never shown to be experienced without the local visible church. The covenant relationship is extremely important. The covenant relationship is basically what you see when a husband and wife get married. They promise and make promises to one another. When you are a member of a church, how many of you remember kind of what you said when you became a member of the church? You'll support the leadership of the church. You agree with the basic structure of our doctrine that you will that you will uphold the church with your time and your efforts and your prayers and your giving, and that you will love one another, support one another, and strengthen one another. 
And we promise to do that together. And there's richness in that promise. In, in the visible church, there are multiple congregations as opposed to one. The one church, the invisible church, is one congregation. Here were many. And all believers are directed to be under spiritual authority, to worship with one another, to give to God in the church, through the church, and to be in fellowship with one another and all that entails. The local church leaders, biblical leadership, is spelled out in several places in Scripture. And, it, and, it, and the biblical leadership is who determines who belongs. And so the elders of your church are the ones who say, yes, I see a change in Frank. I believe that God has worked inside of him, and we affirm that we believe that's what God has done. We can't know it perfectly, but we, we receive Frank to be a member of the church. And so the members of the church must, number one, bear evidence of a transformed life, spiritual baptism. Members of the visible church must affirm the doctrines taught by the apostles, as we mentioned earlier, that they must covenant to come under the authority of the leadership of the church. They must be baptized with or in water as a public profession of their faith. And in the case of those baptized in another local body, confirm their baptism and their loyalties to the new body. We have something different today than we had in the New Testament. In the New Testament, there was one church at Corinth. There was one church at Rome. We only have the early stages of the church. But as it grew, there became more and more congregations. Again, all under the authority of the Apostles' Doctrine. All members of the great invisible church. But yet there became many. And as we understood doctrine differently over the years, maybe we break off. And again, I love my Baptist friends, and I love my Methodist friends, and I might not agree with them on every point of doctrine, which is, makes it okay for us to worship in different places and come together on the big things. But today, we have something different. Today, when we're baptized, we're baptized into a church, but we might move. How many of you grew up in this church? Raise your hand. Baptized in this church. And how many of you did not? Go ahead and raise your hand. See, there's more who have not than there are those who have. And so we're more of a mobile society. We're in a world now where there's multiple expressions of what it means to be a church, and sometimes the Lord will lead us from one to the other. Nonetheless, when we come together, we reaffirm our baptism, we reaffirm our faith, and we covenant with this local body of believers to do the work of the Lord in and through this visible church that we call Goodlitzville Church. Today, let me ask you, have you come to the place in your life where you say, I want to be in that covenant relationship? There's a difference between dating and being married. It's in that richness of covenant that the great fulfillment happens. God wants you to be a church member. We're not pressuring you. That's up to you, between you and the Lord. And if you're not and you have your reasons, that's fine with us. But we want to invite you. If you've been praying about that today, you feel free to come and partner with us and covenant with us. Come under the leadership of people who will help you and be with you and, and, and help us do the things that God's called us to do. And so let me just ask you a few questions. Number one, have you been filled with God's Holy Spirit? Have you been baptized with this Holy Spirit? Has there been a time in your life where you've had that old heart of stone taken out and you have a desire to follow God? When you sensed him in your life and you confessed him as your Lord and Savior, he, he, he came into your life and now you have that witness of his Holy Spirit in your life and you have a desire to follow after him. Has that happened in your life? It's not anything that you could do. It's God making that move. How many of you remember that time like John Wesley said, I felt my heart strangely warm and God changed your life from the inside out? How many of you need to be baptized, that you've never, you've never acted on that faith, that you've received Jesus, but you've never made that external sign of baptism. That's the one God gave us to give. And so do you need to make that step today to say to the world, I belong to Jesus. This is what he's done in me, and I want to be a part of his church. Thirdly, do you remember today that you are part of the invisible universal church, and will you have fellowship with others and will you pray for people in other parts of the world? Sometimes we'll see on the news about a group of Christians being persecuted, and we'll say, ah, that's not us. It is you. It is me. We need to lift them up. And would you realize today that we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses who are cheering us on, those who have gone on before. Today, are you a part of that universal church? 
looking forward to the day the trumpet sounds and the bride will be raised to be with Christ. And finally, are you serious about the covenant with the local church? I'll say it one more time. We never see an expression of the invisible without it being expressed in the visible. There was no circumcision of heart in the Old Testament without the circumcision of the flesh. There's no membership in the universal church that says, it's just me and Jesus, we got our own thing going. It's always lived out in the life of the local church. Are you engaged? Are you involved? Are you committed? Today, I'm going to give you just a few moments. Ken's going to play. And if you need to make that commitment today, maybe God's already moving on your heart and beginning that process of regeneration. It's followed by our faith. Lord, I know that you love me. I know that Jesus died for me. I sense you working in my life. I ask you to forgive me of my sin, and I trust you. Today, maybe you need to make that decision. Today, maybe you've made that decision, but you've never been baptized. And you need to say today, I want to be baptized. You're welcome to come right now, and we'll do it right now. Or you're welcome to put a, give me a card and drop it in the back and let us know that you'd like to be baptized next week, and we'll do it then. Regardless, you need to make that decision. Thirdly, will you commit to pray for people around the world, to minister to people around the world, to love other Christians and other backgrounds in other parts of the world. And finally, do you need to commit to being a member of whether you attend this church or another church? Do you need to commit and make that next step? And if you are a member, do you need to recommit yourself to what it means to being a member? This is your time. If you need to come forward and speak with me, I'm here. If you want to be baptized, you feel free to come. If the Lord's leading you to join the church, I encourage you to come. As Ken prays, I'm going to ask the rest of us to bow our heads and commit ourselves in these four areas.